uh, Felix Leditsky. Uh, I guess uh, he's currently, are you currently in Illinois, Felix? <laughs> yes. Very good, okay. Uh, yeah, he'll talk about teleportation and dense coding and how they're dual to each other, please. Thanks so much, Mario. Uh, I apologize for not being there in person, uh, but I'm very grateful to the organizers for allowing me to give my, my talk remotely. So this is joint work with Eric Jutambar, my uh, U of I colleague in the EC department. And the work is on the duality of teleportation and dense coding. And uh, the aim of our work was to get a fresh perspective on teleportation and its, its connection to dense coding. And so our starting point is, is the famous teleportation protocol from, from the, the early 90s. Uh, let me give you a brief recap of this protocol. So we have two parties, Alice and Bob, who share an entangled state, which I call five plus here. And then the goal for them is using the shared resource state together with classic communication, which are these two double green lines here. Uh, they try to use these resources to teleport and uh, an unknown state sigma from Alice, Alice's lab to Bob's lab. And so when they are given this, this entangled resource state, what they can do is they can choose uh, a protocol to achieve that. And this always consists of two parts. The first part is that Alice performs a local measurement on her systems. So the, the A half of the entangled resource state and the, the C system, which holds this unknown state. And so for us, this is the most general <clears throat> thing that we can do, which is a, a POVM, which is the most general measurement. Uh, you can also think about, about this as a quantum quantum to classical encoder. And this measurement yields an outcome X that Alice communicates to Bob through this classical channel. And then based on that outcome or on that message, Bob applies a family of decoding operations to his share of the entangled state B. And the goal, this produces a, a quantum system C prime, and the goal is that his uh, half of the entangled state after the protocol will hold a copy of the unknown state that is as close to the original one as possible. And uh, <clears throat> the original uh, 1993 protocol by Bennett et al. Um, showed that if you start with, with an actual five plus state, so a, a maximally entangled state on two qubits, let's say, and else performs a bell measurement in the measurement step here, then Bob can apply a, a one, of, one of the four poly uh, decoding operations to his share, and then that will actually achieve perfect teleportation uh, deterministically. So this always works, and it always gives you uh, an exact copy of the, of the teleported state. Our starting point is to look at teleportation protocols where this entangled resource is not maximal. So it's in general not even pure, it's, a, it's some mixed state with some entanglement in it. And then we try to analyze the power of teleportation protocols that you can implement based on this uh, noisy entangled state. Okay. And so again, given this, this uh, state row AB, which is now a very general thing, um, a teleportation protocol again exists, uh, consists of two parts, namely that measurement step that Alice performs and the decoding step that Bob performs. And so we call this, this triple uh, of rho, the measurement pi, and the collection of decodings d, a, a one-way teleportation protocol. And we can actually view this as a channel from C to C prime, because all that teleportation is trying to achieve is to send a quantum state through a channel. And when the entanglement is noisy, then this channel will in general be noisy as well. So in terms of this data, the teleportation protocol, you can write down the channel. So this is uh, this teleportation channel down here. And now we ask, how good is the teleportation protocol? Or equivalently, how good is this implemented channel? And this was first addressed in, the, in a famous paper by the Horodeskis uh, in the late 90s, where they looked at two different ways of uh, assessing the quality of this teleportation channel and protocol, and then trying to relate the two. Okay. And so the first one is that you actually just check how well does the teleportation protocol teleport a pure state on average. Okay, so what you do is you, you, you take a measure on pure state, this comes from the hard measure of the unitary group. Then you input that pure state into the teleportation protocol, which for us now will be this channel, uh, channel lambda. 
And then you check uh, the fidelity with, with the, the target state, which is just this overlap here, the inner product. And then when you integrate over the whole uh, set of pure states over the hard measure, then you get this average fidelity, or we call it teleportation fidelity. Hodesk is called it that. Uh, and so this is measuring, on average, how well does uh, the teleportation protocol teleport unknown states. There's a different way of doing this, where uh, some kind of like static figure of merit, where instead you take a maximally entangled state, so let, assume that Alice uh, prepares um, a maximum entangled state on, on a system C and a, an auxiliary system C double prime. And then she aims to teleport half of that state using the teleportation protocol. The other half, the C double prime system, is just unaffected and stays with her the whole time. Then the channel outputs a certain system C prime. And then you can ask how close is this still to the uh, maximal entangled state that you started with. Okay. And this is the so-called entanglement fidelity or your teleportation entanglement fidelity where again, uh, it's just the fidelity of the output state with the, the target state, the maximum entangled state phi plus. And then famously, these two figures of merit are related. This is one of the nice results that our desk showed in this, in this uh, uh, late 90s paper. So there's a nice formula that connects the average fidelity, which is always a lowercase f, uh, with the entanglement fidelity, which is a, an uppercase f. Uh, and you also see here the dimension c of uh, the system that you that you aim to teleport from Alice to Bob. And our our work tries to uh, address the question of how else we can interpret this entanglement fidelity f of lambda. And we do this by generalizing a known relation from a subclass of teleportation protocols called port-based teleportation protocols, which frame this entanglement fidelity in terms of a certain state discrimination problem. And so the starting point for our work is this somewhat easy observation, so that's why we call it a lemma, not a theorem, that with any general teleportation protocol, you can always reinterpret the data that you have and, and make it look like a state discrimination problem. And the way it works is that, uh, remember, you have these three uh, data for a teleportation protocol. You have the state row AB that they share initially. You have the measurement that Alice performs. And you have these, uh, this collection of decoding operations that Bob performs, uh, conditioned on the, on the measurement outcome X. And so what you do now is you take your shared entangled state row AB, and you apply all of the decoding operations to the B system, so that you end up with an ensemble of states. Okay, so these are these omega states here, omega X, one for each uh, decoding that Bob can choose. And now you have an ensemble of states and you can try to uh, distinguish them. You can try to discriminate them using a measurement. And the lemma says that the, the entanglement fidelity is up to a propor proportionality factor exactly the success probability of distinguishing these different states that you get from the decoding operations applied to the entangled state using the measurement that Alice performs in the teleportation protocol. Okay, so here you have the formula um, this proportionality constant is n over c squared, but then here in the brackets, you have uh, this trace quantity of measurement operator x times the, 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 the state omega x that you get from applying the x decoding to the, the, the entangled state rho ab. And then <clears throat> it turns out that here you actually have a state discrimination problem with a uniform prior, so this is the 1 over n factor here. And then, so this, this is exactly the success probability of distinguishing these states. And the entanglement fidelity of the teleportation protocol is just a, a function of this, okay? So this, this creates an operational connection between any teleportation protocol and a corresponding quantum state discrimination protocol. And again, as I said before, this, this was known in the, in the special case of port-based teleportation protocols, and it, it, it was realized there that it's very helpful in analyzing these teleportation protocols. And our starting point is to generalize this first to arbitrary protocols. Okay, and using this, this reinterpretation of the entanglement fidelity, we now want to ask the question of how useful is a given state for teleportation. And here we, we adopt the, this uh, viewpoint that every 
the entangled state is given to you. The entangled state is the non-local resource interpretation. So, so Alice and Bob cannot choose that. That's given to them by an experiment or, or by some, some referee or whatever. What they can choose is the two local data, the, the measurement that Alice performs on her side of the lab and the collection of decoding operations that Bob performs on his side of the lab. And we also, for technical reasons, we also fix the, the dimension of the, the system that you try to teleport because you're also free to choose that in a way, right? So you can, I don't know if it, why you would want to do that, but you could aim to teleport a very, very large dimensional system uh, using qubits or something, okay? Uh, but this is this is also a, a datum that, that, that they can choose. Um, and so we fix the, the entangled state and this dimension, and then we maximize the, the fidelity of all teleportation protocols uh, defined in terms of these. Okay, so this means uh, explicitly that uh, we now maximize over the measurement that Alice can perform and the decoding that that Bob, the decoding operations that Bob can perform. And you also you already see here that this is this is a bilinear problem. So this is a hard problem to do uh, mathematically. And I'll, I'll come back to that uh, point later in the talk. And again, uh, the, the the entangled state is hidden in this omega x. So the omega x states are the states that you obtain by applying the decoding operation to the b half of the shared entangled state. And then the pi uh, measurement tries to distinguish them. And there is a very simple thing that you can always do, and it doesn't even need entanglement shared between them, which is this classical uh, protocol of Alice just uh, choosing an orthonormal basis and measuring in that basis, and then and and Bob also knows that basis and and uh, based on the outcome that Alice gets from her measurement, Bob just prepares that classical state. Okay, so here the decoding operation is just tracing out the the entangled the, that half of the state and preparing the x uh, basis state. And then obviously you, you can you can just check that this trace quantity here is is just equal to one in that case. And the, the capital N for this protocol is just the dimension of C. And so then you see that this formula here just reduces to one over C. Okay. So one over C is a is a value that you can achieve with any resource uh, that you that you start with. Okay. And uh, because this is achieved even without entanglement, this is called the classical teleportation uh, threshold or classical threshold of teleportation. And we try to ask, or we, we try to answer when this bound is actually tight. And so it has been known that there are entangled states that cannot surpass this classical limit, so the bound entangled states. And our um, uh, our generalization of the state discrimination connection actually gives a very neat, uh, and, and, and in my opinion, simple proof of this fact. Uh, let, me, let me explain you how that works. So here, the relevant thing, it turns out, is the so-called reduction criterion. Uh, which is a, a, a necessary separability criterion. So we say uh, a bipartite state satisfies the reduction criterion if this operator inequality is true. And every separable state, it's easy to check that every separable state always satisfies this. So this is one of these necessary uh, separability criteria. It is weaker than the PPT criterion. But people are still interested in it because um, what the Hordesk has proved in this paper is that every state violating the reduction criterion is distillable. Okay. So once you find a state that doesn't satisfy this operator inequality, you can derive a distillation protocol that distills entanglement from that state. And what is important for us is the, is the observation that if we start with a state, rho AB, that is not distillable, then obviously when I apply a local map, which would be one of these decoding maps, uh, the state stays undistillable. And then by point two, we know that it, it satisfies the uh, reduction criterion. So these omega x states that appear in the state discrimination problem, they satisfy the reduction criterion. And because the, the decodings are uh, trace preserving uh, quantum channels, we have this simple uh, operator inequality in terms of the uh, the marginal row A of the entangled state and the identity on C. And then you can plug this into this, this uh, fidelity formula in terms of the success probability. And then uh, you see, you just use this operator inequality here in this step. Uh, you upper bound the objective function here, and then you, you find that this can never exceed one over C. Okay. 
And so the corollary of that is that bound entangled states, which by definition are entangled but not the syllable, uh, can never exceed this classical threshold of 1 over c, where c is the dimension of the state that you try to teleport. Okay, so this is a nice uh, new proof of this uh, known result, uh, again, by the Horodeskis in the late 90s. And we can make this a little more quantitative even. <clears throat> and this is the one of the main results in our work. Namely, we prove that a bipartite state rho AB is useful for teleportation. And here by useful, we, we mean that uh, you there is a protocol that lets you exceed this classical threshold of one over C. So there is a protocol for which the fidelity is strictly greater than one over C. And we prove in the in our paper that this is possible if and only if there exists a local processing of your entangled state such that the result violates the reduction criteria. Okay, so think of this E as one of the decoding operations from before. This is the kind of the connection to, to what I said before. Um, because if you if you can find one channel that 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 makes this state violate the reduction criteria, and you can then cook up a teleportation protocol that has provably better fidelity than one over C. And let us compare this with, with the classic result by the Horodeskis, who derived a similar uh, kind of like characterization of the usefulness of states. And so they proved that a state is useful for the uh, C-dimensional interpretation in the same way as, as, as I said it before. So again, this means that you can surpass the, the classical threshold. If and only if there exists a one-way LCC map L, such that um, the so-called signet fraction so the, the overlap of the resulting state with the maximally entangled state exceeds 1 over C, this classical threshold. <clears throat> and so now we see that you can interpret our work um, as, a, as a simplification of this, of this uh, criterion because you, you go from, a, uh, from an optimization over all one-way LCC maps to just an optimization over, over local maps. And it's enough to know um, whether the resulting states violate the reduction criterion. And a nice example is is uh, can be found in a family of Werner states. So let's take a, a three by three, uh, so two curtits and a, a Werner state on on these two systems, which is a, a linear combination of the identity and the swap operator. And it's known that Werner states are uh, when you choose this parameterization here, then Werner states are entangled if if and only if that lambda is strictly less than zero but they always uh, satisfy the reduction criteria, which you can just check. <clears throat> but now uh, we, can, we can try to find, uh, we can try to apply our result by, by trying to find a map that we apply to one half of the burner state, and then the resulting state should violate the reduction criterion. So we turn a state that passes this, the reduction criterion into a state that fails it. And so it turns out that for three by three Werner states, there's a simple map where basically you collapse Bob's system to a, 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 a two-dimensional system. So here it's this particular projection map here. And it turns out that for a certain range of the lambda in which the state is entangled, the resulting state violates the reduction criterion, and therefore <clears throat> those Werner states are useful for teleportation in the sense that you can surpass the classical threshold with them, even though the actual resource state, the Werner state, does uh, satisfies the reduction criteria. Okay, so here we see that we really need this map or this post processing that turns the state into one that violates the criterion. <clears throat> okay, now let's talk about the um, this connection between teleportation and dense coding. So this is uh, also not new. This was this was known. Uh, since the, 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 the conceiving the idea of teleportation. So again, in teleportation, you have a shared entangled state. Uh, you perform a local measurement. You communicate the outcome classically, and you apply a decoding map. And ideally, this implements a, an ideal quantum channel, a noiseless quantum channel. And dense coding somehow turns this around now, where uh, you again have your uh, shared entangled state. But now, actually, Bob doesn't receive the classic information to select the decoding, but he encodes the classic information using the decodings. Okay, 
So based on the on like say he has a classical random variable, based on the outcome, uh, he chooses one of these decoding operations, and encodes somehow the classical uh, information into that entangled state. Then you send his half of the entangled state to Alice using a noiseless channel. So here we assume that we're in this in this noiseless uh, channel situation where they have a, a, a noiseless quantum channel. And now Alice has uh, both her half of the entangled state and this half of Bob that has been processed. And then she aims to, to decode the class information using a measurement. Okay. And this is really, um, we, we now connect teleportation protocols to dense coding protocols that are defined in terms of the exact same data. Okay, so what was the, the, the encoding in teleportation, the measurement, is now the decoding step in, in dense coding. And what was the decoding step in teleportation, the quantum decoding, is now a classical to quantum encoder. Okay. And so because, because you kind of like switch sides, we, we talk about Alice to Bob teleportation protocols and then Bob to Alice dense coding protocols, because that's, that's somehow how the duality works if you, if you write this down. And so therefore, <clears throat> every teleportation channel can gives rise to a, a dense coding channel, which is just a, a channel from, you know, a, a classical channel. So you, you aim to, to, to transmit one of uh, N messages. And the dense in dense coding refers to the fact when the n that you can choose here is actually larger than the dimension of the the channel, the quantum channel that you have. Okay, so that you can pack more information into that qubit than uh, what's allowed by the whole labor bound. Okay, so of course the labor bound is not is not violated because you have to look at the bipartite uh, system, but this is what the dense refers to. And the nice thing is now that this um, this classical uh, information transmission problem is now intimately connected to the, the state discrimination problem. And that's exactly how we make um, the connection between teleportation and dense coding. Okay? And in order to do this, we also want to have the same uh, figure of merit as before, where we say, okay, how good is this classical channel that we implement uh, using a dense coding protocol? And here we do a, a classical version of the entanglement of fidelity, basically. Okay, so what was the, what, what played the role um, what was the maximum entangled state before is now um, a maximally correlated classical state we call gamma plus here. So this is this you can understand this as a classical analog of a maximally entangled state. And then we do the same thing as before. We we send one half of this maximally correlated classical state through the, the dense coding protocol to Bob, uh, sorry, to Alice, from Bob to Alice. And then uh, we compare with the target with a perfectly correlated state between uh, the system that Bob holds onto and the system that is now with Alice. And so this is really a classical uh, version of the entangled fidelity. Um, so we call it a classical correlation fidelity. And you can show that this is actually related to a success probability because it's 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 really <clears throat> The average success probability of transmitting the right signal using your channel. Okay, so th this here, the W X given X are the transition probabilities that define the classical channel. And <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> we want to again, same as with teleportation before, we now want to determine what quantum resources, what states, give you an edge over classical uh, protocols. So we again want to identify this classical threshold uh, for dense coding. And it turns out that uh, for dense coding, this is the minimum of one and the ratio of C, the, the, the dimension of the system that you uh, aim to teleport, or that's that's the channel in the, the, the noiseless quantum channel in dense coding, and the number of messages N that you aim to transmit in dense coding. Okay. And <clears throat> you can now again see pretty um, uh, in a straightforward way that there's always a protocol that doesn't need entanglement that uh, transmits uh, classical messages with success probability equal to this to this quantity, okay? And so uh, this is this is the classical threshold that that is now again um, this kind of uh, thing that we want to surpass in dense coding. 
And now the second main result in our work is, is, is a theorem that is formally very similar to the teleportation theorem. And it comes exactly from like rooted in, in, in this discrimination, uh, state discrimination uh, formulation. And so the theorem goes that if, if n is greater than a dimension of the, of the, the quantum channel, so we, we aim to uh, code densely, then a bipartite state Roy B is useful for dense coding. Again, useful meant in the sense that we want to surpass the, the classical threshold. If and only if, same criterion. There exists a channel such that the, um, the, the state that you get from applying the channel to half of the entangled state violates the reduction criterion. Okay. So this works in the exact same way. And um, I'm running a little out of time, so let me just come to the conclusions. So in our work, we, we formulated, we kind of revisited this known duality between teleportation and dense coding and, and found a new viewpoint on it based on this uh, way of viewing a teleportation protocol as a state discrimination problem. And um, the nice thing is also that we have a so-called quantitative duality because we can also, which I didn't show you, but we can also derive um, bounds on the accessible information in the dense coding picture in terms of the fidelity in the teleportation picture. Okay, so we have a nice quantitative um, relationship between teleportation and dense coding, which generalizes uh, and extends some some known uh, duality results that were that were derived by Reinhard Wern, uh, early two thousand. And uh, this is all based on on this observation that comes from porpoise teleportation that you can view a teleportation protocol as a state discrimination problem, uh, and then the fidelity of the teleportation protocol or the classical correlation fidelity of the dense coding protocol is a function of the success probability in this, dis in this discrimination problem. And one, <clears throat> one key uh, takeaway message from our work is that if you put these two main theorems next to each other, you, you see that the, the if and only if condition for surpassing the classical threshold is the same in both cases. And so therefore, a, a, a takeaway is that a bipartite state can exceed the classical teleportation threshold if and only if it can exceed the classical dense coding threshold. Uh, and then we ask the question, what, what are the states that can surpass this? And we give this answer in terms of uh, uh, states violating the, the reduction criterion after post-processing. And so this leads to a to a nice open problem that we're working on right now, where we want to uh, decide for a given state whether whether that uh, um, uh, resulting post process state can violate the criteria and therefore surpass these classical limits. Uh, and I think uh, <clears throat> I'm running I'm really running out of time now, so let me just flash this here. We can reformulate this uh, this bilinear optimization problem in 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 a way that makes it a little nicer and easier to study, and um, this is uh, current ongoing work, and please, please let me know if you're interested in this or have any questions. Thanks. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Felix. Uh, do we have questions? Anyone? The audience. Yeah. So maybe uh, can you go one slide back, Felix? So. Mm -hmm. uh, when you say numer so this is not an, an, an SDP, the way you write it, but it's numerically feasible for small dimensions anyway. How does that It's work? definitely not an SDP, it's a bilinear problem, right? Because you have, it's yes. just a rewriting, but if you look, if you yes. think back to that point where you have, uh, you know, you have the measurement operators and then you have these um, states that come from applying the decoding to the entangled states. So you have, and it's a product of the two, so it's a bilinear problem. But, but, but in what sense is it then numerically feasible? Like how do you? Um, attack this? Um, well, I mean, kind of like seesaw uh, optimizations see. or something. Okay, okay. They, 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 if you compare it to a brute force thing, they kind of like give you the, uh, that, yeah. they, they give you the right answer, but obviously this doesn't scale. Uh, so we want to, we want to okay. study the, the, the known realizations of these problems, uh, maybe check these um, rank loop things from the, the MPA hierarchy, stuff like that. So there's, there's a lot of things we can throw at this. Understood. Thanks. Thanks, Felix. Any, any last questions, the audience? Uh, it seems not. So very good. So let's thank Felix and all the, the speakers again. Thanks, Mike.
Uh, yeah, 